For watching this video, you have decided to dive into the exciting world of sound. Good for you. Hello and welcome. My name is Sam. I'm Marcus Hall. My name is Sam Greenberg, and Mike and I will be guiding you through the amazing world of sound and its relation to physics. Because after all, without physics, there'd be no food. There's a lot to know about physics of sound. For example, what makes this so annoying? We'll find out oh, in the physics. If you're as clueless about sound as Sam and I once were, you're probably wondering what the sound looked like. But there's not exactly visible, so we kind of have a graph here. Sound is both a pressure and mechanical wave. Therefore, if we could see sound, it would look something like this. Wait, I'm not done. There are only three things you need to know about this graph. The lower levels of pressure are called the refractions, and the higher levels of pressure are called the compressions. And the distance sound travels is called a wavelength. Refractions, compressions, and a wavelength. <clears throat> Fractions and compressions will become more important to us later when Sam and I discuss shock waves. Now, as soon as Sam gets back from the drugstore with his bottle of Noxzema, we can continue on. What you'll notice before my car hit that tree is that the sound of my car's horn did not sound the same the entire time. As my car approached nearer, the sound got louder and slightly higher in pitch. This is physical evidence of the Doppler effect. As the car passed the cello, the wavelength of the horn sound was longer, and when the car was approaching the cello, the wavelength of the horn sound was shorter. This is summarized with the help of a delightful toy lent to me over the weekend. This can also be observed in this incredibly annoying piece of machinery. Notice that when the wires are connected, the ball produces a sound at a constant frequency. Now, when the cello swings the ball, the distance to you is decreasing, and so the same number of sound waves must travel through a shorter distance, resulting in a higher frequency. Now let's talk about one of the more interesting topics behind this physics of sound. Music. What kinds of music, Mike? All kinds. Really? Yes. All music is composed of sounds. Sounds of all different frequencies and pitches. From every note to every opera, sound is what makes music work. Whoa, Mike. What you just said is way too broad and easy to remember. Is there any way you can make what you just said needlessly complex? Certainly. The majority of music is caused by simple vibrations where you to stretch a guitar string as tight as possible and have a friend pluck it, you wouldn't hear the same sound as if it was connected to an acoustic guitar and then plucked. This is because the sound hole... The what? The sound hole. Oh. Okay, keep going. This is because the sound hole takes the vibration of the guitar string and reverberates it until it becomes amplified into a vibration called a force vibration. This can be observed on a guitar. Or even a piano.
Hey Mike, is this a good time to talk about beats? The periodic and repeating fluctuations heard in the intensity of a sound, or the vegetables? Uh, the first one. Yeah, I would say so. Well, beats are an important part of music and the physics of sound. The human ear recognizes a beat when amplitude changes. Okay, can you show me what you mean by this? Sure. Craig, play that song you've been working on for a while. You know the one you had Mr. Del Vecchio work with you on? With pleasure. <laughs> ah, knock it off. Sorry, I was just admiring how amazing the human ear is. What do you mean? Well, if we didn't have ears, we could never hear any of the sounds that exist in the world. I think, therefore, the ear is worth discussing on this video. I suppose. The human ear is split into three parts. The outer, middle, and inner ear. The outer ear, which includes the ear flap which is responsible for collection and channeling of sound. The middle ear serves to transform the sound into internal vibrations that are received by the eardrum and then translated by means of the three small bones located in the ear. Wait, there are three bones located in the ear? Yes, they are the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Hey, I'm not sure, but isn't that something Mr. Mordorsky didn't know about previously? I think you're right, Sam. Anyway, from there, the inner ear t then takes the energy of the compression wave and translates it to the nerve impulses that feeds directly to the brain. See, I told you, you're not the only one here who's constantly beating. Shut up, Sam. So what about the intensity of sound and the decibel scale? What about it? Well, I think it's important to note that the intensity is the amount of energy that is transported through a given area by means of a sound wave. Therefore, intensity equals energy over time multiplied by area. This is the mathematical explanation for why there is an inverse relationship between intensity and distance. Ooh, tell me more, Mr. Scientist. I will. The faintest sound which a human ear can detect is known as the threshold of hearing and is rated at zero decibels. Normal conversation is about 60 decibels and the front row of a rock concert is about 110 decibels. The point in which the ear begins to experience immediate pain as a result of sound exposure is about 130 decibels. Despite the fact that the human eardrum is very strong, and it still has its limits. So, with the exposure of about 160 decibels, a person could expect instant deafness. However, a military jet takeoff is about 140 decibels, so the chance of any of us will be losing our hearing soon is pretty unlikely. Are you finished? Not yet. Decibels can be measured using tools such as this sound meter. However, even though its ability to display the amount of decibels in a room, the measurement of how loud a sound is remains subjective. Ah! Ah! What the heck are you doing? Uh, just trying, you know. Catch the speed of sound. Are you serious? Don't you know that the speed of sound is 750 miles per hour? Yeah, so what's your point? There's no way it's gonna happen. The fastest a human is capable of running is 11 meters per second. That's pretty crazy. Did Mr. Wardarski know that? Hmm, I don't know. In any event, because sound travels so fast, an echo must occur at least a tenth of a second after the initial sound to an in order to distinguish between the two sounds. That's fascinating. So, Dicello, you said something earlier about shockwaves, didn't you? Thanks for reminding me, Sam. I almost forgot to tell you. Whenever a source of sound, such as an airplane, travels at or above the speed of sound, a shockwave will result. This is because compressional waves build up and create a sound known as a sonic boom. Since every compression wave is followed by a refraction wave, the high pressure zone will immediately be replaced by a low pressure zone, which, like I just said, will, will result in a boom sound.
Hey Digello, are you curious to see what a shockwave looks like? Heck yeah! I'll show you. Watch the water. Notice the ripples going outward. That would be what a shockwave would look like if you could see it. Looks cool. That reminds me, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about. When we went to Sikorsky, one of our tour guides told me that the blades of a helicopter uh, move at the supersonic speed, and that's what gives helicopters that distinctive thundering sound when flying overhead. Interesting. Alright, so do you want to go somewhere for lunch? Yeah, sure. Where? I don't care, I'm not hungry.